All right, welcome back all. Um, I think we're week 28. I always get these confused. But today we're going to start talking about, um, we're going to continue on with potatoes, grains, and pasta. And <clears throat> this week we're just going to cover corn because there's many different styles of corn that are used um, from fresh corn on the cob, which we don't really, we talk about that more in vegetables. Um, but this is dried grains. So we're gonna talk about polenta, cornmeal, and masa, which are all made from corn, but they're made different grinds, different styles, different types of corn, different varietals. So let's go ahead and share screen. Um, this is gonna go pretty well. I got some uh, good slides put together for you guys. Um, let's go ahead and look at this. Okay, so let me, let me move me down here. So common uh, corn derived products. So you have cornmeal, which are dried kernels, yellow, blue, white. Um, other varieties include corn flour and polenta, which we're going to, I'm going to show you what polenta is used in hot cereal baked goods as coating for frying. Um, even popped corn, you know, corn kernels, it's a dried grain. It's dried. There's a little tiny bit of moisture still left inside there. That's what makes it pop and explode like that. So once you heat that, the water inside the corn kernel expands and it pops up. All right, that's why it pops corn. Um, a lot of people have no idea. It's they don't take fresh corn on the cob and fry it. That does not give you the same thing. It's a dried corn corn kernel. Uh, and it, depending on what kind of popcorn you buy, is dependent on what flavor it's going to have. If you buy cheap popcorn, I pop my own corn. You know, I buy this the kernels and I pop them in a pan. Um, if you buy the really cheap ones, half of them don't pop. Some of them have a bad flavor to them. Some of them even taste moldy. Um, so I buy the more expensive ones only because for what you get in a bag, like if you buy the bags of popcorn you throw in the microwave, <clears throat> those cost probably two to three times more than buying a big bag of kernels and popping it yourself. So to each his own. Um, okay, so the first part we're going to watch is this guy just breads catfish. This is like my favorite way to eat catfish is just um, dredged in cornmeal, seasoned, and then deep fried. And then um, the second video is called polenta, which we're gonna make this week with our uh, sauteed chicken. We're gonna do like a chicken piccata, pretty much, um, served with roasted asparagus and creamy polenta. So you guys will see how to make this. It's really easy to make, um, but I'm gonna show you these two videos and then we'll go over cornstarch. So let's go ahead and start this one. Welcome back to this Thursday edition of Good Day. We hope your morning is getting off to a nice start. And you know, because one day is not enough. No. It is National Catfish Month. And that's why we're very happy to welcome Aaron Stoudenmeyer with Lovers Seafood and Market. You've been open since Thank March. You. Yes, March, sir. So it's yes, sir. Still pretty new. Absolutely. We're going to celebrate uh, National Catfish Month, a little all you can eat catfish lunches for the whole Ooh. month. And I'm going to show you how to do it here real quick. Okay, okay. great. Very nice. All right. So we're gonna let this catfish hang out in oh. uh, in milk. Um, How long? For about an hour. That's gonna oh, keep really? the flavor okay. nice and clean. All right. Just milk. Yep, just milk. Okay. okay. And then uh, that's gonna make, go into this flour. That's kind of a mix of cornmeal flour, uh, granulated garlic and onion. We're just gonna okay. kind of give that some love the way Grandma does, you know, right there. And that's gonna go straight into a deep fryer at about 350 degrees. Now. The way to make this healthier, I know we're frying this, it up. The way but... to make this healthy is you take that exact same cut and you drop that in an oven. Oh, okay. And you just okay. roast it off okay. and it'll get just as crispy. Okay. That's great. And um, so otherwise it's the same recipe. Okay. Exactly. Great. And while that's cooking, we're going to throw together a little, uh, little variation of tartar sauce. We're going to use some mayo, some capers, little poblanos, because, you know, we are in Texas. Oh, yeah. The, uh, the capers go in there because they give you that pickle kind of salt punch, but you also get to use... Is that mustard? Fresh, fresh lemon. That's whole grain mustard. This okay. is a little lemon juice right here. Wow. And a little sea salt. Boy, okay. and that, that fryer is starting to make its presence known. Oh, it'll, they'll, uh, they'll make sure you're paying attention. They're, they're like little <laughs> kids. They, they, wanna, they want you to know. So this is real quick. It gives you a little, little acid, little spice, touch of salt. Okay. Really very simple. So we're going to slide right over here. Oh, yeah. And this is... Uh, this is it. You take this, you blow that down your plate, you give it a little swoop because that's how you make it fancy. And as you're plating this up, I have to tell you, what I love about your place is that you've got the market as well. 
Let's talk about that. We do. Everything that we uh, we sell on the menu is available uh, as as retail sale out the door. So if you don't feel like us cooking, you can do it yourself and take anything with you. And pretend like you did it. And you can <laughs> pretend you did it. You know, we'll cook it for you and send it with you, or we can send it to you, send it with you. Uh, and tell, you can do it at home. And tell us what to do, which is what e I like. Exactly. You can, you can ask the experts there. I am good at telling people how to cook. There you go. <laughs> okay, Eric, that thanks great. so much. Thank Lovers, you guys. Lovers Seafood and Market, West Lovers Lane in Dallas. And again, that special deal for National Catfish Month, the lunch deal is. All, all you can eat catfish lunches all month through April, uh, August. All right. And you will find this recipe and a link to Lovers Seafood and Market at our website, fox4news.com. All right, so that is just a real quick way. Frying catfish is not hard. He was saying it comes out the same if you bake it. I don't think so. Um, you're not going to get as crispy as you could in a deep fryer as you would in the oven. If you have an air fryer, they get the probably the closest. Air fryers are literally like a very intense convection oven. But what you have to do is put a little oil in there and it literally just like whirls that hot oil air around the fish. Um, but you really can't mimic a deep fryer. I mean, people have tried. It does not work. You could pan fry it if you want to be a little healthier. Um, but it's still, you know, the deep fryers typically have a cheaper version of cheaper oil in them. Whereas uh, if you pan fry it, you can do like a higher end oil that's not as high in LDL saturated fats. So if you want to use a, you know, like a pure canola or something like that, you could deep fry it in that or pan fry it. But anyway, frying it is the best way. <clears throat> I do this kind of recipe with uh, catfish is the best, I think. Um, you could do this with chicken. You could do this with, I know a lot of people that do like a um, cornmeal flour blend for their fried chicken and it really gets crispy because flour can get crispy, but cornmeal can get a lot crispier. Um, pork chops, whatever you want. So that's one, that's just a quick way. You saw how that was. He probably fried that for about six minutes, seven minutes. That's why they didn't keep it on there because the show is only a few minutes long, but you only need to fry it for a few minutes until it gets a nice golden brown. Typically when you fry something, it'll start to float towards the top. That's just kind of how frying works. Um, that's a typical thing. Look for color and wait for it to float. Um, so yeah. Also used in hot cereals, baked goods, you know, corn muffins, that kind of stuff. It's the same cornmeal, okay? That's the same thing you're going to do, cornbread. Um, this one is called polenta. So the difference between cornmeal and polenta is the way, the type of corn used and how much they break it down. So corn flour, cornmeal is broken down almost sugar-like texture. Polenta is more chunky and like a little thicker, but I'm going to show you this one. This is a pretty good uh, video of how he makes this creamy polenta because this is what we're going to do this week. What up, you guys? Chef Billy Parisi here from BillyParisi.com, and I'm getting ready to hook up an amazing Italian classic dish called polenta. It's going to be creamy. It's going to be delicious. So let's get after it. Polenta is such an easy to make classic recipe. You can serve it up as a side dish or even as a main entree just by folding in chicken or steak. I've served it up with scallops. I've served it up with grilled skirt steak. Even just put mushrooms on the top. Dude, is it good. And you can even make polenta cakes the next day if you're sick of eating so much creamy polenta. So if you've ever heard of grits or been down south and had some nice creamy grits for breakfast, they're pretty similar to polenta. However, there are still some nuances. Polenta uses yellow corn cornmeal and grits use white corn cornmeal or hominy. But I will say that polenta tends to be a little bit more on the coarse side, like a medium grind where Grits are definitely like a smoother, almost like a cream of wheat, if I could say that. Both are delicious, still a little bit different. And since I'm Italian, I'm always gonna go with polenta, my friends. But let's get into making this, because it, like I said, it is incredibly simple to do. We're gonna start by small dicing up an onion. If you've never done this before or got the onion to the exact size that you're looking for, don't worry, it's really easy go ahead and slice off each end of the yellow onion. Next, what we're gonna do is cut it in half and just simply take the peeling off of one half and then to small dice, starting from the bottom up, 
simply slice into it, but leave about a quarter of an inch on the other side. Do not slice all the way through it. Go all the way up, maybe every quarter inch. And then simply do the same thing, but slicing down on it. Every quarter inch, slice down, 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 all the way through the yellow onion. Then simply slice it every quarter inch or so. So you got this beautiful quarter inch small diced yellow onion. We're gonna set it to the side and next for some garlic. What I like to do is simply give it a little mash with the flat part of my knife. This just breaks it up to help small dice it up a little bit more, or in this case, finely mince. So go ahead and mince that up as best as you can. Make sure it's pretty small because you don't want huge chunks of garlic in there. We're gonna set it to the side in a small bowl. Take that and the onion, go over to the cooktop. And I've got a nice size Rondo pot. You can use a regular soup pot, whatever you've got laying around. We're gonna add some olive oil in there. And over medium heat, let's go ahead and add in the onion. We want this to be like a little bit brown. We're not looking for a full caramelization, but we do want a nice little toast on it. It's just gonna simply enhance the flavor of this creamy polenta. After about three to four minutes, let's add in the garlic, give it a quick stir. And they always say for garlic, once you can smell it, it's already done. So you better turn down that heat so it does not burn because you know what, it will burn and fry pretty dang quick. So keep your eye on it. Now at this point, simply add in your chicken stock or you can substitute with vegetable stock or water. Now we wanna bring it to a boil. Once it does start to boil, especially around the edges, we are in good shape to now add in our yellow cornmeal. Now, when you do pour it in, you want to remember to continually whisk. This will stop your polenta from having huge, weird, crazy chunks running through it. So whisk it constantly while pouring in the yellow corn cornmeal. And of course, everyone's got that stance where they put their hand on their hip while they whisk. You don't believe me? You're gonna catch yourself the next time you're whisking or flipping something over. This takes in total in between 15 and 20 minutes while continually whisking on medium low heat for the polenta to just about be finished up. I always like to taste it after this time and if it's got a very slight crunch, also known as al dente or to the tooth, we are in good shape to finish it off. Now what I like to finish it off with is a little bit of whole unsalted butter. This adds a really nice creaminess to the polenta. And then to take it up a little bit more, I'm next gonna add in some grated fresh Parmesan cheese. This is gonna bring about some amazing, salty, delicious cheese flavors into this polenta. Give it some really nice whisks, make sure it's completely combined. And just like any recipe that I make, please finish it off with a little bit of sea salt, fresh cracked black pepper, whisk it in there, make sure it is combined. And at this point we are done, so it's time to plate up. Go over to your countertop or wherever you plan on serving it. Simply transfer some of the polenta right to your serving bowl. To finish it off, what I like to do is add on some shredded Parmesan cheese and a little bit of finely chopped Italian flat leaf parsley. Boom, we are finished. Let's have a look, try it out. Polenta is just one of those comforting recipes that you can honestly eat all day long. It's like the Italian chicken noodle soup. You can graze on it and you just can never get enough of it. It's so incredibly simple to make. I can't state that enough. And just a wonderful side dish or accompaniment to any main entree that you plan on serving up, whether it be friends or just family. This is almost a surefire guarantee to see lots of smiles on their faces. And of course, I don't wanna wait any longer. I wanna eat some, so let's try it out real quick. Yeah, man, it's just, it's just so good. You get those wonderful cheesy flavors from the Parmesan. That butter just adds some creaminess, some body to the planta. It's delicious. Well, you know, I'm gonna make some more recipes next week, but for now, it's time to eat some polenta. See y'all later. <laughs> All right, so <clears throat> what we're gonna do with that is we're gonna do the creamy polenta and we're gonna do some roasted asparagus with it, which I'll show have a video for you guys. Um, the roasted asparagus is via, I asked several students and they said they want to try asparagus. So we're going to do asparagus and then we're going to do a sauteed chicken piccata, literally. So it's going to be our, uh, pounded out chicken, 
and then we're going to dust it in flour, saute it, and then um, fresh squeezed lemon, a little cream, salt, pepper, and then finish it with butter. So the final liaison will be butter. We're going to pour that over the top of the polenta, and then we're going to have the roasted asparagus go on top of that. It's going to be really good, fresh, clean. Um, and you can do a little lemon over the whole top of it if you want, because lemon over polenta and lemon over fresh asparagus is really good too. So um, that's that's another way of making. It's it's literally like Italian grits. So, but I'm gonna I have a grits recipe coming up too, because grits is like a whole nother different thing. So cornstarch, <clears throat> those are the dried kernels, hull and germ removed, so the outside is gone, and the little piece in the middle of the germ is gone too. So you just have like the starchy part pure white, and then that is used in baking as a thickening agent. So cornstarch is used a lot. A lot of uh, like Asian recipes will fry in cornstarch. So they'll actually like take the raw chicken, toss it in the raw cornstarch, um, and then deep fry it. And then that way, once it's fried, you can toss that into a sauce and or toss it with sauce and it sticks to it and it gets super crispy. So that's just another way to use cornstarch. And to thicken, it's perfect because you can Never add hot water and cornstarch together, always mix cold, but make sure you stir it. And um, I use my hand, a lot of people think I'm gross for this, but I stick my hand in there and mix it with my hand because if you use a whisk, you can't feel if it's actually broke up from the bottom. Um, you don't wanna dump big globs of that in there because it'll, it'll cook and you'll have these big cornstarch dumplings floating around your food. So always make sure you, you I stick my hand in there because it'll sink straight to the bottom like sand and you really got to stir it up. But if you stop stirring it and let it sit for a while, it actually dissolves or like goes back to the bottom of your, your bowl. So always make sure that you have that dissolved. Um, okay, let's go. Where are we? All right. What up you guys? All right, so the next one is um, we have grits. So let me check the time, see how much long we have on this. Okay, the next one we have is grits. And I'm going to show you the next two slides we're going to do. So In it. the last one. OK, so we have. Yeah, sorry, I'm going to go back. So um, we're going to go over grits. Grits is ground hominy, which this is a picture of hominy down here. It's just a bigger it's, it's another type of corn. Um, it's dried kernels soaked in uh, lye canned or dried, but that's what it looks like. And it's probably traditionally started because you the lye would keep it like it's a way to preserve, literally. So drying or, you know, you could soak it, marinate it, salt it. That's those are old school ways of keeping things for a longer time. So ground hominy, which is right here, um, used in baked goods, hot cereals, side dishes, popular in Southern cuisine. Um, this guy, Sean Brock, is a, a pretty famous chef. And this video goes over like how he makes the Southern style grit, uh, shrimp and grits, classic recipe. Um, but he, he describes a lot more of how important it is to get the specific corn. Tomorrow, we're going to finish going over hominy, which we're going to go over the history of pasole. And then the last um, slide is going to go over masa, which will be on for tomorrow. That'll be tomorrow's section. We're going to talk about pasole and then masa and then um, handmade uh, tortillas. Okay, so... We're going to finish today with going over grits so let's watch this real quick making grits in the south for your family is a rite of passage when you visit someone's house and they didn't cook their grits properly you probably shouldn't marry into that family hey i'm sean brock and i'm here today to celebrate the release of my new book south and i'm going to be making one of my favorite recipes in the book very traditional and simple version of shrimp and grits. This recipe is really important to me and I wanted to include it in the book because it's a, a tribute to one of the most iconic Southern chefs. His name was Bill Neal. He was one of the first chefs to have the courage to take these simple rural kind of home cooked dishes, these old traditions of the South and say, these are worthy of a white tablecloth restaurant. We're gonna do something that I've been practicing since I was a little kid and still try to do better. The simple act of making grits. But these are real grits. This is an old heirloom varietal grown by my friend in South Carolina. And so many factors that you have to keep in mind when 
cooking grits and, and buying grits because if you start with a varietal of corn that tastes like nothing, your grits are gonna taste like nothing. You can see the coarseness, you can do them finer and get a creamier grit or you can do them even more coarse than this uh, and, and get something very, very rustic like a porridge. This is something that really changed the art of grit cookery for me and that is soaking the grits overnight so that the grits get a little head start. There are different parts of the corn kernel and during the milling process, they all get busted up and they all gonna go in the same place. And they would cook the grits for like four hours. That used to drive me crazy, which is how you get overcooked tasteless grits. And it's these little devils in here. All that will rise to the top. You just take a skimmer and anything that floats, you want to skim off the top. We'll let this soak overnight, that's what I prefer, but at least eight hours, and you'll see more rise to the top. This pot has been sitting overnight. You can look at it now. Compared to what it was before, there were tons of different specks. It's the endosperm, that's the outer hole. That's really pretty, that's really nice. Another step is making sure there's none of this stuff on the sides, and so take your hand or a spatula and, and wipe that back down in there or off. Now we're gonna crank the heat, wait for this to come up to a boil. The boiling starting to, to happen, starting to get creamier. Man, that smells good. When you're cooking grits, there's a lot of different ways you can go with the liquid that you choose. Some people use milk, some people use cream, some people use different stocks. I am such a purist, I like just to use water. To me, if you just dump a bunch of milk in here, it's gonna taste like milk and grits. This is just pure, honest to goodness, um, grit flavor. And now, it's all starting to come together. We're gonna give them a little chance to meditate and rest. Okay, so these have had some time to kick back in the lazy boy and relax a little bit. You can see they're much happier. I like to change the pots out because it gets stuck on the side, gets stuck on the bottom, and once it gets stuck, you're screwed. Leave no grit behind. We'll bring them back up and then we'll find that perfect temperature. This is a really important flavor profile for Southern cooking. Bay laurel grows all over the South, everywhere, side of the road, along the beaches. This has always been a primary backdrop flavor for Southern cooking, starting with Native Americans. Mm -hmm. And I always tear it a little bit. I mean, I like to imagine that this is this smell, this flavor goes back as far as grits can go back. No matter how low you can get this simmer, it's still gonna stick. There's, there's no way around it. We cook grits in enormous pots, which makes it even more difficult. So we have a rule. If you can see it with your eyes or walk by it, scrape the bottom, give it a stir. We'll allow it to cook for at least an hour, but my rule is to check it every 15 minutes. What I'm looking for is bubbles evenly, not just around the side. And no, there's no way to save it <laughs> once you scorch it. I've tried every possible thing you can imagine. Now that the grits are cooking, we're gonna do the, the really fun part, and that's to make the topping for the grits. We'll start with country ham. This one is heavily, heavily smoked with hickory. Our tradition of curing pig legs and smoking them is one of the great sources of pride for us Southerners. When you're cooking these one pot dishes in the South, you will see a lot of times starting off with fat that has some umami to it. And so that's what this does for this dish. But this can be any sort of um, smoky, funky, fermented, salty, fatty, anything. Cooking slowly, render it out, and then crisp it up. If you add tiniest, tiniest touch of just another fat, it just kind of jump starts that process, helps it along. You just let it sit, do its thing. I think listening is such an important part of cooking. So while that's dancing around, we'll put some of these in there and we'll season them salt and pepper and flour. You know, you want to get just the right amount of flour on there. It serves two purposes. One, 
flavor. The flour will brown and have a different flavor if the shrimp were just in the pan. But also, this is a really quick way to use this flour uh, like you would a roux. I love button mushrooms. I don't care what anybody says. I will eat these raw. You slice them kind of thick. Where I'm from, when these are growing, they'll, they'll be every dinner, every lunch, there'll just be a pile of these on the table. You're eating and you're literally like, in between bites, you're just crunching, crushing. I'll kick this out to the side. I'll lay them carefully in the pan and not mess with them. If you just close your eyes and listen to that, imagine if this was just like in your, like every bathroom in your house, you just go into, imagine listening to that in your shower, in your sleep. That's where I want to take it off the heat so that it doesn't continue to cook. And I'm gonna carefully turn each one of these. We'll add in some mushrooms. Okay, so now I wanna add the liquid transfer of heat and energy is gonna finish cooking the shrimp. Save some for the top. It's starting to thicken up and the shrimps nicely cooked, so I'll season it quickly, but doesn't need much salt. So hot sauce. We'll add some butter. So while that's melting, we'll adjust our grits. Grits are finished and beautiful and creamy. Salt, white pepper, <clears throat> butter. Hot sauce. So now here's where grits get really personal. I like for it to fall just like that. It's like this wave crashes. Yep, that's the way I like it. Or right before serving, that's when I always add lemon. So I'll just add a tiny bit to that. And the same thing here. Right at the very, very, very end. The grits to go and cover the bottom so that you're guaranteed to get a little bit of grits with every bite. Whew, God bless America, look at that. This is the, the purest, most honest version of shrimp and grits in the restaurant world and so easy to make. That's soul food. That's the soul of our region. When I taste this, I have no doubt that Southern food is amongst the best in the world. It's not only how delicious this food is, but it's, it, this reminds me of like, why grandma food is so good. It's like grandmas know the secret to how to build those flavors to make you feel a certain way. And that's why you crave those things. And that's why I love this. For the recipe, click the link in the description below. And you can buy my new book, South, which has other shrimp and grit recipes. So <clears throat> that was the shrimp and grits. Um, I've seen several varieties of this. I thought this one was really good because he goes into really how to explain the importance of the corn and how to cook it and what to watch for. That's the thing that chefs kind of learn is you can buy, you can look up recipes all day on Tasty or online, but you really have to watch, like you have to know what to look for when you're cooking these things, what to smell. Um, what to hear, you know, just everything about it. You know, you could walk around and just stir it one time and I could tell you if it's done or not. You know, it's just, it's just something you have to do a thousand times to figure out how to do it properly. So you can read recipes all day, buy all the cookbooks you want, but it's, it's practice and experience that, you know, is going to get you to make these things really well. So um, we're going to stop there. We're going to finish tomorrow or day two with hominy and masa, because there's a lot about these two. Um, I learned something every time I research these things to describe them to you guys, like what I learned in books and what I've learned from restaurants. I learned more by just looking up stuff and that way I can regurgitate it to you. Um, so that's where we're gonna stop. There'll be four questions for you guys. And uh, yeah, I'll see you tomorrow.